In this video, I'm going to show you what a typical Clojure development setup should look like. If you're new to Clojure, setting up your tools properly should help you get the most out of the language. Because Clojure is a Lisp, the tooling used is different from what you might find in other languages, so I thought I'd make a video uh, explaining it. I won't go into specifics of how to install or configure specific tools, but I will showcase some important features just so you can get an idea of what the tools can do for you. I'll leave links in the description to detailed installation and setup guides. Now, there are two main features that any Clojure editor ought to have. One is structural editing and the other is an integrated REPL. Let's talk about structural editing first. A common problem encountered by beginners is just dealing with all the parentheses in Clojure code. This problem is greatly mitigated by just letting your editor do a lot of the work for you. Clojure is a lisp, which means that uh, Clojure code is structured as a tree of nested expressions, just like this. Uh, and it's not a sequence of statements that come one after the other. Uh, and because uh, the structure of Clojure is, um, you know, this tree form, we also need uh, our editors to support uh, modifying this tree uh, in a more rich way. Structural editing is just that. It's a way of navigating and editing code as a tree of expressions. It's a, shed of, it's a set of keyboard shortcuts that let you make changes to Lisp code without ending up with uh, unbalanced parents. It lets you take advantage of the structure of Lisp code rather than being burdened by it. The most common structural editing schemes are paredit and parinfer. Let me demonstrate some editing using paredit just to give you an idea of what's possible and why it's useful. However, a full structural editing tutorial is beyond the scope of this video. I'll leave some links in the description to, to, to uh, some tutorials that you can check out. Now with paredit, uh, the first thing that I want to point out here is that you cannot delete parens. So I'm pressing the backspace key on my keyboard right now. This paren is not going away. Uh, and the same goes for closing parens. I'm pressing the backspace key, the, the cursor is just moving left. Uh, and this applies to square uh, brackets and the curlies as well. Uh, if you want to delete parens, the only way that you can delete them is if you have an empty list. So this is considered a list. Uh, anything in between uh, open and closed round parens, you can delete the opening paren and it goes away. So how do you get anything done then if you can't delete parens? Uh, well, there are shortcuts to help you. One of them is spit, uh, which means if you have a list and you want uh, you want to emit or remove something from the end of the list, or another way of putting it is move this paren over to here. I can do that. I can slurp it back in, uh, and I can go the other way as well. I can do it for the left paren go back, I can go one step over, so that's slurping and spitting. There is also, uh, there are also some more interesting uh, shortcuts. For instance, there's splice, which will just remove surrounding parens. I can splice that, I can do it again and it gets rid of the square parens. I can splice here. I can raise which is a little more complicated. So what raise will do is it'll take an expression uh, and replace its parent uh, S expression. So I can raise this and then the JDBC execute will go away and we'll just have this in its place, just like that. I can cut and paste uh, while preserving uh, the syntax of the S expression. I can paste that here. And there's many more commands that I haven't gotten into. Uh, I'm using Cursive, which is a plugin for IntelliJ. Uh, and in Cursive, you can view all the uh, commands by going to Edit Structural Editing. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole bunch of things that uh, I haven't even demonstrated. Uh, although this might seem daunting at first, uh, if you practice and you use these shortcuts often enough, they'll become second nature. And eventually, you'll reach a point where you can edit Clojure code uh, much more easily than uh, you can edit other languages even, thanks to structural editing. 
And because I've become so familiar with it, I don't have unbalanced parens in my code anymore, not even by accident. Uh, do keep in mind that uh, although these operations are mostly standard in Paradit, uh, so most editors should support um, most of these operations. At the very least, you should be able to slurp, barf, raise, uh, splice, uh, kill, and so on. Uh, but the exact shortcuts uh, will be different. So be sure to look up the shortcuts uh, for whatever editor you choose to use. The other uh, scheme of structural editing is parinfer. Uh, let me demonstrate that. I'm just going to exit distraction free mode. Um, and since I'm using cursive, I can actually toggle between par edit and par infer. And also, as you can see here, I can switch off structural editing if I want. And so if I'm overwhelmed by the shortcuts, um, and I just want to edit regularly, I can switch structural editing off uh, and then just do whatever. Um, but I don't recommend this unless you absolutely have to. I would recommend uh, that you stick to the shortcuts uh, because that's the quickest way to get familiar with them. Now, moving on to parinfer. Uh, parinfer doesn't have, um, you know, it, it's not the same as parinfer. It, it, it doesn't work based off of shortcuts. Rather, what you do is you adjust the indentation of your code. Um, and parinfer will automatically infer where the parens are supposed to go on the basis of that. So, for instance, uh, if I wanted to spit these two uh, expressions out of the list, so I just wanted the closing paren to end up over here, what I can actually do is insert the closing paren. I'm just going to indent that. Um, and what's actually happened is the closing paren has moved from way over here, um, back up to here, right? Uh, and if I want to put these elements back into the list, then I can just indent them over. So tab, and then you see that the closing paren is here. I can tab this over, the closing paren uh, moves over. Um, you can also delete opening parens, and it'll delete the closing paren as well. If I insert an opening paren, um, parinfer will also insert a closing paren and it's going to go as far right as possible. So in this case, the closing paren has ended up over here. Um, I can insert one here and then the closing paren goes there. Uh, all right. Um, and that's mostly it when it comes to parinfer. Personally though, I prefer paredit uh, because it's a lot more uh, powerful and more predictable because I'm telling my editor exactly what I want it to do. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of beginners find parinfer more approachable because there's just not so many shortcuts to learn. So you may want to check it out. Again, the rules might seem daunting, but they'll become second nature with time. Uh, I'll uh, link to a guide to the rules again in the description. Now, aside from structural editing, uh, the second feature that you definitely should look for is an editor integrated REPL. Clojure is a language that's designed to be worked with interactively. This means running small pieces of code at the REPL and building up your program with a fast feedback cycle. The processes of development, debugging, and testing in Clojure all use the REPL. It is such a crucial feature of the language. I'd go as far as to say that if you're not using the REPL when writing Clojure, you won't enjoy the experience and you might as well choose another language. The most primitive way uh, to use the REPL would be just to have it open in your terminal uh, with something like line REPL. Um, but an editor integrated REPL offers a much more seamless experience. So allow me to demonstrate. Again, I'm using cursive and I have an integrated REPL uh, right over here. Now what can I do? Uh, I can load an entire file with a keystroke which is going to compile all expressions in this file and make them available for me to use in the REPL. I can uh, change my namespace. Um, so now I'm in this namespace I can use um, bindings that are defined here. So I can look at what the DB spec is for instance and I can of course call functions. 
the REPL also has um, multi-line editing. And uh, it also comes with the same structural editing features uh, that you saw, uh, you know, just in the regular editor. So I can spit and slurp and so on and so forth, uh, even in the REPL. It supports, uh, I can evaluate expressions that I type directly into my editor even. I don't necessarily have to type them in here. There we go. It has a history that I can navigate, so I can browse through my history, rerun commands, uh, and in the case of uh, cursive, I can even bring up a searchable history page, um, and then I can start typing and filter things out. And if something happens to go wrong and you get an exception, cursive will actually um, clean up the stack trace for, for you and present it nicely. There we go, just like that. Uh, and you can see that I can actually click on these and jump to uh, the file names. And again, although I'm demonstrating this in cursive, uh, most editor integrated REPL, REPLs should have um, uh, all or most of the features that I just showed you here. I think that structural editing and an integrated REPL are the bare minimum features that a closure editor ought to have. And I know many professional uh, closure programmers who wouldn't even consider writing closure code without these features. Uh, that being said though, there are a few other useful editor uh, or features that closure editors offer. Uh, so one of them being autocomplete, as you can see here, it automatically completes and this applies to the REPL as well. You can jump to definition, so I can jump to the routes here, I can jump to this, I can even jump into this library function. There we are. Um, we can preview documentation. We can refactor intelligently, so I can shift F6, fetch book name. And if I rename it, uh, you will notice that here on line 29, it's changed as well. So the references are also changed. And it also supports uh, running tests. Now, um, There are a couple of different ways of running tests. You can just run tests with a single function, which is provided by the closure test uh, library. Or I can actually run the tests through cursive uh, and it'll underline the exact assertion that is failing. If I hover over it, it shows me the difference. I can click on this or I can click on this uh, and see a more detailed diff here. Uh, so these are all very convenient. So now besides these features, um, another uh, useful to have feature is a linter. Uh, it isn't strictly necessary, um, but it is very handy as I'm about to demonstrate. Uh, so when it comes to linters, CLJ Condo is a very popular linter for closure. It analyzes your code and it notifies you of various different errors before you even run it. And this is, I think, particularly useful if you're a beginner uh, because you're still getting familiar with the syntax and CLJ Condo will notify you of some basic syntax errors. Uh, so it can really reduce the amount of time that you spend uh, debugging basic mi syntax mistakes. You can even edit, integrate it into um, many popular closure editors and it'll just show you the, uh, the errors in line. Uh, and, but the instructions to integrate it, uh, of course, vary from editor to editor. I'm going to demonstrate CLJ Condo, uh, and I will use VS Code for this, uh, not cursive, uh, just because it's easiest to integrate into VS Code. Um, so there is a, a small amount of initial setup that is necessary. I need to make a .CLJ Condo folder, and then I just need to run this. 
And again, I will link to uh, the CLJ Condo GitHub uh, page in the description so you can look at the detailed setup instructions and why I'm running this um, over there. Uh, but this initial step is necessary uh, for CLJ Condo to kind of understand your project uh, and be able to show you some more intelligent errors. Uh, now, if I open VS Code, and I have CLJ Condo integrated here, um, as you can see, it's already showing me a problem. So it says that uh, restart server is um, not being used anywhere. Right? Uh, and it can do a bunch of other things as well. So if I just go to the handler, um, and let's say I delete this. Right? It shows me a, a few different things. So the first thing is it shows this error here. Um, it says ring util response is called with zero args, uh, but it actually expects one argument. Right? So it shows you arity errors, um, which is very useful, uh, especially if you're a beginner and you tend to misplace your parens. Uh, you might end up with arity errors, and this will help you catch that. Uh, it's also showing me that this binding is not used. It's showing me that this function is not being called anywhere. So all of this is very helpful. Uh, it also shows a few other things like say, um, if I have a do block here, um, it, you know, it's already giving me an error. It says that uh, the do is redundant. Um, you don't need a do block and this is because defin, um, the body of defin is wrapped in an implicit do block. So this isn't necessary, which is handy. Um, it'll also detect inline defs. So if I have, if I'm debugging something and I add an inline def here, CLJ Condo is going to pick it up um, so that you don't forget to remove the inline defs once you're done. So as you can see, it's very handy, uh, particularly if you're a beginner. Uh, and that I think covers most of the development conveniences that you'd want. Um, again, Structural editing and an integrated REPL are absolutely necessary, I think. Uh, and CLJ Condo is, I would say, not strictly necessary, but I would recommend it. Uh, let's move on uh, to which editor you'd want to choose. Uh, so at the time of making this video, Emacs with the CIDR package and IntelliJ with the Cursive plugin are the most full-featured editors. Um, however, Cursive, uh, which I'm using here, this is cursive. Uh, it's not free for commercial development. Um, and Emacs, of course, it comes with its own steep learning curve. Uh, so unless you've, if you've not used Emacs before, you're going to have to learn all the Emacs shortcuts and so on and so forth, uh, and how to configure it. And if all of that's not your cup of tea, VS Code, which I'm using here, uh, with the Calva extension, uh, is a very good option. Um, it's free and it's pretty accessible. It even comes with uh, CLJ Condo bundled in. Uh, so if you install Calva, it's going to install the CLJ Condo VS Code extension. Uh, so you don't have to do any setup uh, just beyond what I showed you here. Um, and aside from VS Code, there's also plugins for Vim and Atom. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, these are all the most full-featured editor plugins. Um, so just to recap, you want structural editing, you want an integrated REPL, and optionally, you want CLJ Condo. And your options are Emacs, um, IntelliJ with Cursive, you have VS Code with Calva, and again, this is what I would probably recommend if you're an absolute beginner and you're not familiar with Emacs uh, and you don't want to use IntelliJ. Um, there's a Vim user, there's a Vim Fireplace that you can install. You can install Chlorine with Atom. 
Uh, and again, I'll leave in links to uh, installation and setup instructions in the video description. But I would recommend that you choose um, from these five editors here. I hope these pointers help you get set up with a good dev environment. And as I said er earlier, uh, these are the essential features and make sure your editor has them. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below or in other community forums linked in the description. Thanks for watching.